This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Here at Feedback, we tend to believe in broadcasting cock-ups. But here are a couple of mysteries which are a gift to conspiracy theorists. Why did the BBC maintain radio silence over a 50,000-strong anti-austerity rally? I've always thought of the BBC as being a fair and relatively impartial reporter of news in the past. Have I been naive? Also... Who at the BBC has it in for Samantha? And has Jack D really threatened to pull out of I'm sorry, I haven't a clue? We can't just dampen down the naughty bits. We have to have naughty bits in our life. That's what makes it amusing and funny. Also this week, the producer of A History of the N-Word discusses when, if ever, it should be used on the air. You may try to ban the word, but do the sentiments that have informed the word, does the history that has informed the use of the word, has that disappeared or not? That's what interests me. We begin feedback this week with a march of which you may never have heard. That is, if you only listened to the BBC and did not read the newspapers, despite the fact that it started right next to the corporation's news centre. Last Saturday, it was estimated that around 50,000 people marched from Broadcasting House to Parliament Square in central London to protest at the government's austerity measures. Now, I know that because I read it in a newspaper the following day. I did not hear about it on BBC Radio. This lack of coverage angered many of you. I'm Steve McEvoy and I'm from Cardiff. What were the specific criteria by which the judgment was made not to devote any serious coverage to the People's Assembly march against austerity? 50,000 people marching to protest against a cornerstone of the incumbent government's policy has to be newsworthy, surely. My name is Anne Purbrick and I'm from Abergavenny in Wales. I'm extremely concerned as it appears that the BBC are willfully ignoring a major demonstration of public opinion and this raises ugly questions as to what the political involvement might be in this case. My name's Bev Nicholson and I'm from Cambridge. It's been noticeable in the past few years that the BBC has a real reluctance to report on any significant protest. It looks very odd that the BBC either won't tell us anything about them or will only say very little. Can you find out what the BBC's position is on this and challenge their reluctance to report them? Well, we'll try, Bev. Of course, the best way to start would be to interview a BBC News executive about what happened or did not happen. So we asked for someone from News to come on to feedback. And this is the answer we received. In this instance, we're not going to be able to facilitate an interview. Not facilitate an interview? Ah, they mean not give one. Hmm, we had hoped that, given the number of complaints, someone would have spared ten minutes to talk to us, even if there were suggestions of a concerted lobby of protest. We would have made ourselves available anywhere, any time. Instead, we were given this statement. We covered this demonstration on the BBC News Channel with five reports throughout Saturday evening, on the BBC News website on Sunday, as well as on social media. So it was covered on a digital television channel. But we were asking about the absence of coverage on network radio. Anyway, the statement goes on. We choose which stories we cover based on how newsworthy they are and what else is happening, and we didn't provide extensive coverage because of a number of bigger national and international news stories that day. We frequently report on the UK economy and what it means for the British public. We also reflect the concerns of people such as those demonstrating and others who hold opposing views. Inevitably, there may be disagreements over the level of prominence we give to stories, but we're satisfied that overall our coverage is fair and impartial. So there you are. No conspiracy, just a debatable editorial decision about news priorities which we and you are unable to debate with those who made it. Does that sound like accountability to you? Please let us know. Contact details coming up later. I think we all need cheering up. What with news non-appearance and, of course, England's defeat in the first round of the World Cup and losing the cricket series to Sri Lanka. So here's an innocent little ditty to brighten any summer's day. Or is it? The sun has got his hat on. Hip, 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 hooray. The sun has got his hat on and he's coming out today. Now we'll all be... Happy. That 1932 version of The Sun Has Got His Hat On by Ambrose and his orchestra might sound innocent enough on first hearing... 
but in fact it contains arguably one of the most offensive words in the English language, one deemed so offensive it is seldom uttered in full on radio. I'm talking about the N-word. As many of you will recall, the BBC Radio Devon DJ David Lowe found himself in very hot water when he played that song on his show in May. At around the same time, Jeremy Clarkson caused a media storm when he appeared to use the same N-word in an unbroadcast segment of Top Gear. It's an issue we've covered on the programme before, and not surprisingly, it provoked a strong reaction, including this from Esther Slattery. I feel devastated as a black woman, as a mother who experienced racism from strangers time and time again, people stopping when I'm with my children and shouting the word. Every time I hear that word, whether it's in person, it brings back all those memories. You can possibly understand how devastating it is when you're listening to your favorite radio and then it flows through the airwaves. There's no excuse for it, no reason for it. Radio 4 tackled this debate head-on last week in an archive on 4 entitled simply A History of the N-Word. The programme contained a great many examples of racist language. I've been discussing the issues surrounding the word's use with the producer Colin Grant and Radio 4's editor of Editorial Standards, Roger Marney. The first thing I wanted to know from Roger was whether or not the BBC would allow us to use the word in full in our discussion. In short, yes. As ever, with anything that has the potential to cause offence, any strong language, any racist terms, context is everything. So you have to think about where we're broadcasting, on what service, to what sort of audience the programme, and if you're on a programme where people wouldn't usually expect to hear racist terms and racist language, then we want to be cautious about it, and perhaps a little more cautious than we would on a programme that's broadcast in the evening specifically about that word. But let's not tie ourselves up in knots trying to have a discussion about it without using it. I think people are strong enough to realise that, actually, when we're using it, we're using it not to condone its use, but to consider its use. OK, well, we can use the uh, N-word then. But let me ask you, first of all, Colin Grant, the producer of A History of the N-Word, uh, why did you want to make it? Where did you get the idea from? Uh, after the recent kerfuffle over a number of incidents where the N-word nigger has been used in the public domain, it struck me that there's still a timidity about the use of that word and still a nervousness, whether it be the general public at large or within big corporations like the BBC. And it's a word that I've been thinking about for a number of years. I am black. I wouldn't call myself a nigger. But I wouldn't be offended if someone called me Negro. Because I recognise that over the years, the descriptions that people have used to describe black people have changed. And sometimes black people will describe themselves thus in a way that might be considered to be offensive today. And so for you, is it a question of the context and who uses the word rather than the, the use of the word itself? For me, it's the context, not so much who uses the word, because I think that it would be a shame to deny that things have happened, that words have been in our vocabulary over the years, and to try to excise or to delete those words would be a disservice both to us, to our children, and to future generations. I mean, you've written a, a biography of the great black leader Marcus Garvey, and you called it Negro with, with a hat. hat. Yes, I called it Negro with a hat, Marcus Garvey led the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He embraced the word Negro, and in fact, in 1920, they had an international conference of the Negro peoples of the world where they decided that they would no longer answer to N-I-G-G-E-R, lowercase, they would only answer to Negro, uppercase. And so talking about that and him and that period, it would be nonsense not to use the word. Absolutely, it would make no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And did you, when making this programme and going through the archive and looking at things, did, did your view change about the use of the word, the way it's been done? I was surprised by what I found in the archive. I was born in 1961. In 1964, there was an election, and in the town of Smethwick, the word was used in a rather disparaging way to describe black people on the walls of Smethwick. And I quote, If you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. I was surprised that that existed. I didn't know about that. And I was surprised also by the fact that we have assumed that the problem of the N-word was largely an American problem. I think the programme showed that right from the beginning, this is a problem both of the US 
Britain and of the Atlantic slave trade. Well, Roger Marnie, when you heard this program was going to be made, uh, what, did you attempt to influence it? Did you say to them, look, you can use the N-word X number of times, or what did you do? I think when you're going to tackle a programme like this, there is no quantity you can put on how many times you're going to use the word. And you shouldn't attempt to inhibit the free discussion. The programme will be what it is, which is a consideration of that word. The important point is, as anything that has the potential to cause offence in some contexts, one of the big factors is, is it good? Is there quality there? Now, that's quite subjective uh, sometimes. But in this case, it's just, is Colin's programme going to really contribute to the debate and understanding of something that at the time was quite in the press in sometimes a quite knee-jerk, reactive sort of way? Will it have changed anything, this programme, in terms of the use of the word? Will we be hearing the word more frequently now, do you think, or not? No, you'll just be hearing the word when it is editorially appropriate to use it uh, and in a way that doesn't condone its use. Colin, can I ask you, when you hear pop songs now by black artists using the term, Mm. do you think they should be broadcast? I think, as a human being and as a black person, I don't like to hear the word nigger in pop songs, personally. I understand the intention on the part of some black hip-hop artists to reclaim the word... Whether they're successful or not, I think is up for debate. What interests me about this discussion about the N-word is the the fact that you may try to ban the word, but do the sentiments that have informed the word, does the history that has informed the use of the word, has that disappeared or not? That's what interests me. If we were to ban the word, what would be the danger of doing that from your perspective? Well, as a historian and as a BBC producer, it means I wouldn't be able to use the word. And I think that we would be diminished as a people, as a a nation, but also in terms of the history of human beings on this planet. To deny the word or to try to delete the word would be to try to delete history. It would be as if it had never happened. And we're not in the business of denial, are we? Our thanks to Colin Grant, the producer of A History of the N-Word, and to Radio 4's editor of Editorial Standards, Roger Marney, who, by the way, checks this script to see that it complies with those standards. If you'd like to enter the debate about that issue, or indeed about anything to do with BBC Radio, please do get in touch. You can write to Feedback, PO Box 67234, London SE1P4AX, or leave a phone message on 03 triple four five double four standard landline charges apply but it could cost more on some mobile networks or of course you can send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk or you can tweet us at bbc r4 feedback all those details are on our website and now music to soothe the savage breast The unmistakable sound of sailing by, the nightly introduction to the shipping forecast, one of Radio 4's most enduring institutions. Is it in danger of sailing off? Well, back in December, we told you that the BBC had sent out a questionnaire to members of the Royal Yachting Association, the national governing body for boating, asking how they get their information about the weather when they're at sea. Some doomsayers suggested that could sound the death knell for the shipping forecast as if the answer came back with a resounding off the internet, of course, Radio 4 would stop broadcasting the shipping forecast on long wave. Well, dear listeners, we can exclusively reveal the results of that survey. I'll be discussing them and their implications with Radio 4's network manager, Dennis Nolan, in a moment. But first, never willing to swallow the official line without doing our own research... Feedback has commissioned its own in-depth survey of another group for whom accurate weather information is a potential lifesaver. OK, what we actually did was to send Karen Pirry to the Cornish fishing port of Newlyn to hear fishermen's tales of their experiences of the shipping forecast. Nicky Ringwood. The guys would walk down the quay in the morning. It was really fresh weather and uh, all the fleet of boats would wait there deciding whether to go to sea well, hang on to 2 o'clock. Wait till 2 o'clock, because that's when the forecast was coming out, you see. Their whole lives were basically dependent on the shipping forecast. There were warnings of gales in South at Sierra and Fisher. West Viking. Gales in Sears. There's always up north, you know, Viking, Cromarty. My name's Mark Payne, and I fished for 
best part of 40 years out of Newlyn. Northerly or northwesterly, five to seven. A lot of people go on the web, don't they, to find out the, the forecast for weeks ahead. But I still think that they get that wrong so often that it, it's got to be... That's a 12-hourly forecast, a shipping forecast, so it's, it's essential, really. I work up the North Sea. I'm a, a skipper of a supply boat in the North Sea. I used to fish here. I fished here for 20 years and then went away to work. And we get the, our forecast gets emailed through, and I get wind updates every six hours. If you want the shipping forecast, you don't have to wait until 2 o'clock to get it now. You can just Google it now, can't you? It's so accessible. My name's Rob Parsons. I'm the Harbour Master of Newlyn. People will go on uh, websites such as the Vet Office, XC Weather, Magic Seaweed, uh, or download apps. Smartphones and tablets now are uh, a lot more accurate than they used to be. The, the modern-day fishermen, I believe, would probably use that rather than other sources of information. So is the shipping forecast of any use at all? Um, from my Royal Naval background, they used to put it on um, British Forces radio, and it was more just like listening to something from home. But I think, me personally, I haven't used it for years. North Foreland to Selsey Bill, north or northeast, veering east or southeast, three or four. Name's Jeremy Jones. If we're working inshore, we can work from the telly, from mobile phones, but the problem is these days, since they've altered to digital, you do struggle at any distance to pick up the television. Mobile phones, exactly the same. Hence, the shipping forecast on the radio is vital. In that report from Karen Pirrie, the consensus seemed to be that the younger generation use other methods of forecasting, but that the older one still swears by the shipping forecast. So, Dennis Nolan, Network Manager of Radio 4, do the results of your survey tally with that? Yes, it does. Uh, what we get through the questionnaire is the sense that there is a very broad range of sources on which people draw for their marine safety information. They range from uh, websites and apps through to broadcasts, whether by the Coast Guard Agency or by uh, Radio 4. And is there a generational divide here that older people tend to listen to Longwave more than younger people? Well, that seemed to come through in your interviews. And we know in general that, that the audience for uh, Longwave is older than the FM or DAB audience for Radio 4. But we didn't ask any age-specific questions in our questionnaire, so I couldn't tell you about the age distribution of usage of the shipping forecast uh, on Radio 4. And how reliable is this questionnaire? A thousand people, I think, responded very roughly, but it was a self-selecting group. It, it was, yes. Oh, first of all, we distributed this questionnaire through uh, yachting magazines uh, and other outlets, so it was clearly you know, addressed at people who are consumers, practical consumers of shipping information. And one would expect that the kind of people who would be motivated to respond to a questionnaire like this would already be people who have a certain commitment to the forecast rather than people who are indifferent to it. So I wouldn't say that it is a, you know, a piece of scientific market research. Nevertheless, we find it very interesting to see that there is uh, an overwhelming response from those who use Radio 4 uh, long wave as they're either the primary or secondary source of marine safety information and a very high degree of satisfaction with the service. And so does this mean that the shipping forecast on long wave is safe for the next, what, 10 years? Well, the shipping forecast is safe anyway. There isn't and there never was any plan to run it down. So that wasn't why we ran the questionnaire. We ran it simply as part of our uh, routine attempt to get feedback from the audience on how they use and appreciate our services. Uh, can I ask you another question uh, about the Droitwich transmitter? My name is Jenny Milnes, and I'm calling from Hythe in Kent. I would like to know when the essential maintenance is going to be completed on the Droitwich transmitters so we can have a full long-wave service restored. FM service in my area is very patchy and digital is non-existent, so the lack of long wave is quite a problem. When will the Droitwich transmitter be running all the time? We expect the repairs currently be conducted to be complete by the middle of July. And I'd like to say, in uh, reassurance of any listeners, uh, long wave listeners, shipping forecast or cricket or otherwise, that we're carrying out these repairs because we want to maintain the long wave service for as long as possible. These are vital maintenance repairs. We really regret that they're causing some interruption to listening. The long wave transmitters in Scotland are still transmitting, but of course they don't cover the whole area that the Droitwich trans transmitter reaches. And there are rather fewer uh, lovers of English cricket in Scotland, I think, than in Droitwich. That, that may be the case. I couldn't possibly comment. 
The other thing I want to say is that the work has to be done now during hours of maximum daylight because uh, it's quite hazardous work, actually. People are sending masts hundreds of feet tall to do these repairs on these very high cables. So nothing you would do in the middle of the night? Uh, indeed not, nor in a thunderstorm. Radio 4's network manager, Dennis Nolan, confirming that sailing by sails on. Now from sea to land, is there an urban bias in the BBC's network news coverage of England? That is the view of some listeners, and they will find ammunition for their arguments in the latest report from the BBC Trust, which was published on Thursday. While stating that the corporation's coverage of rural affairs is on the whole impartial, with a broad and comprehensive range of voices, the Trust says there is a deficit in UK-wide coverage of rural issues in England. The report also said that the coverage tended to focus on environmental aspects of rural UK and said that this should be balanced by the economic and social dimensions. The author of the report, Heather Hancock, former managing partner at Deloitte's and an ex-chair of the BBC's Rural Affairs Committee, made a number of recommendations, including the reinstatement of the post of BBC Rural Affairs Correspondent. I asked her how significant that deficit in coverage was. I think it is important, and I, and I think where it really bites is in the experience of audiences in rural England, whether they see their own lives and their own context being reflected in network output, and whether it's being explained to a broader urban audience. In Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, there was a much closer connection. There was better understanding. There seemed to be more empathy with rural areas. It became more of an issue when we were looking at the experience of audiences in England. And I think you drew attention to what you called a tendency for when there was coverage of rural affairs, particularly in England, to focus on the environmental aspects. And you think that this is, you know, OK, fine, but needs to be balanced. Balanced by what? I think it needs to be balanced by the social and the economic aspects of rural affairs. If we just focus on England, a third of all businesses in England are in rural areas. It's nearly 20% of the population in England. These are people living their lives with all the kind of opportunities and challenges that that presents beyond just the environmental dimension. It's very important. We all value the countryside for its environmental impact, but it shouldn't be the leading prism through which rural affairs are viewed. Now, you've talked about unintentional urban bias. Well, certainly that's what audiences felt, you said, uh, from the countryside in England in particular. What do you think the cause of that was? I mean, in a simplistic you would say, well, look, all the BBC's network news comes from one place, bang in the middle of London. This sort of thing is bound to happen. Well, that may well be true, and I think that is part of the cause of it. There isn't a specialist rural correspondent, so there isn't somebody filtering and presenting content at the network level who has the depth of expertise, the breadth of contacts, the understanding of how stories knit together in rural areas. There's a bit of a default towards rural stories being covered by the environment team who absolutely do their utmost to do that well, but that reinforces the environmental perspective. And it means the stories aren't bubbling up from rural areas in the way that perhaps they could and get a wider audience uh, understanding. Well, looking at the BBC executive's response to these proposals that you've made, they have said they will identify an individual to take an editorial oversight role, championing rural affairs. They have not said that they will establish the post of BBC Rural Affairs correspondent that you wanted. Are you disappointed? I am disappointed. That post did exist. I think it was a very effective post in the two people who held it. I think it did a lot to signal the BBC's commitment and the credibility of its rural coverage. I'm hopeful that the measure they have suggested, which is to use the investigative reporter on Countryfile to do a lot more in this area, will be a good step forward. It was a sort of a halfway house measure that I did offer as an alternative, but it's not as good as having a dedicated rural affairs correspondent. And I think that would have been the single most effective thing that BBC management could have chosen to do. And obviously they have not done so. Now, the Trust will require the executive to report back in six months' time, then a year, to update on what action they've taken. Are you going to be involved in that? Are you going to keep an eye on it? You've completed your report... But uh, is that it for you? That's it for me. I'm, I'm now reverting to being an interested and committed member of the audience, so I shall be watching and listening at some more distance. Our thanks to Heather Hancock, author of the BBC Trust Report. And finally, a news headline that had some of you contacting feedback in dismay, nay, disbelief.
The Daily Mail reports that Jack D has allegedly threatened to quit as host of I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue after he was ordered to tone down the smutty jokes. Samantha has to nip out now as she's off to see a couple of gentleman friends who've been showing her how to train parrots. Hello, I'm Jenny Bradley from Kingston in Surrey. Don't let's give in to the fun dampeners. Surely we women are big enough to enjoy the odd Samantha innuendo. Samantha says she's already mastered a parakeet and tonight she's hoping to get her head round a cockatoo. (laughs) Samantha jokes are really quite naughty, but they're clever as well and they're witty and they're jokes that suddenly make you explode with laughter because it's so outrageous but so funny. So does feedback have a clue about what's going on? Well, we have tried to sort fact from fiction, and it is clear that Jack D is not ready to throw in the towel. In a statement, his agent said, There had been a discussion about some of the show's more risque content following a particular complaint, but this certainly didn't result in Jack threatening to resign. So there was a complaint, and it seems it was taken seriously. We discovered that the original complaint had, in fact, come from a feedback listener who emailed us last year and at the same time emailed the BBC's Editorial Complaints Unit, or ECU as it's known, objecting to the sexual stereotyping of the Samantha characterisation. Now, the ECU didn't uphold the complaint about Samantha, but it did reassure our listener that the substance of the complaint had been referred to senior BBC managers, where it had apparently prompted a high-level review. So, was there a high-level review? there was a discussion with some members of the Clue team. Ah, so that's what's meant by a high-level review. And were Jack D and the team told to tone down the saucy innuendos in the show? The team was not asked to tone anything down. This was a creative discussion about evolving the show, rather than stopping something. Clue fans shouldn't be worried. It's back on Monday, and there are no plans to change the tone of the programme, and Samantha returns in the new series. But tastes and attitudes do evolve. This is why we have regular discussions with production teams and contributors of all long-running Radio 4 programmes to see how we can best keep the much-loved shows funny, clever, relevant and fresh to listeners. Well, I love you, Samantha, and my love is never going to die. And remember, my Samantha, I'm a one-girl guy. But I am a relic of the 60s. So is the Samantha character relevant to today's audience? Or is she a sexist anachronism? Do let us know if you've had enough of her. Goodbye. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Here at Feedback, we tend to believe in broadcasting cock-ups. But here are a couple of mysteries which are a gift to conspiracy theorists. Why did the BBC maintain radio silence over a 50,000-strong anti-austerity rally? I've always thought of the BBC as being a fair and relatively impartial reporter of news in the past. Have I been naive? Also... Who at the BBC has it in for Samantha? And has Jack D really threatened to pull out of I'm sorry, I haven't... ...major demonstration of public opinion, and this raises ugly questions as to what the political involvement might be in this case. My name's Bev Nicholson, and I'm from Cambridge. It's been noticeable in the past few years that the BBC has a real reluctance to report on any significant protest. It looks very odd that the BBC either won't tell us anything about them or will only say very little. Can you find out what the BBC's position is on this and challenge their reluctance to report them? Well, we'll try, Bev. Of course, the best way to start would be to interview a BBC News executive about what happened or did not happen. So we asked for someone from News to come on to feedback. And this is the answer we received, a clue. We can't just dampen down the naughty bits. We have to have naughty bits in our life. That's what makes it amusing and funny. Also this week, the producer of A History of the N-Word discusses when, if ever, it should be used on the air. You may try to ban the word, but do the sentiments that have informed the word, does the history that has informed the use of the word, has that disappeared or not? That's what interests me. 
We begin feedback this week with a march of which you may never have heard. That is, if you only listened to the BBC and did not read the newspapers, despite the fact that it started right next to the corporation's news centre. Last Saturday, it was estimated that around 50,000 people marched... In this instance, we're not going to be able to facilitate an interview. Not facilitate an interview? Ah, they mean not give one. Hmm, we had hoped that, given the number of complaints, someone would have spared ten minutes to talk to us, even if there were suggestions of a concerted lobby of protest. We would have made ourselves available anywhere, any time. Instead, we were given this statement. We covered this demonstration on the BBC News Channel with five reports throughout Saturday evening, on the BBC News website on Sunday, as well as on social media. So it was covered on a digital television channel. But we were asking about the absence of coverage on network radio. Anyway, the statement goes on. We choose from Broadcasting House to Parliament Square in central London to protest at the government's austerity measures. Now, I know that because I read it in a newspaper the following day. I did not hear about it on BBC Radio. This lack of coverage angered many of you. I'm Steve McEvoy and I'm from Cardiff. What were the specific criteria by which the judgment was made not to devote any serious coverage to the People's Assembly march against austerity? 50,000 people marching to protest against the cornerstone of the incumbent government's policy has to be newsworthy, surely. My name is Anne Perbrick and I'm from Abercavenny in Wales. I'm extremely concerned as it appears that the BBC are willfully ignoring 